Hello, this is Rick. Come in. Just kidding. This is a video, and I can't hear you. Ha <laughs> ha. But this video is on the communicators of Starfleet, following in the same vein as the other technological breakdown videos I've done recently, so I don't think that I'll need to iterate on similar contemporary devices, so I'll just phone that section in, and instead pick up right with the first Starfleet-issued communicators. The need for ship-to-ground communication is obvious, and ever since the earliest spacefaring vessels, two-way communication has been necessary. With the advent of warp drive, however, a whole new realm of physics opened up around the study and utilisation of subspace, which needs its whole separate video. Suffice to say, this allowed for the faster-than-light communication required in establishing real-time two-way communication between vessels light years apart. This technology was also applied to Starfleet's communicators. The first we've seen is in the 2150s and were rather small flip-open devices. The aerial or transmitter was fitted in the raised lid of the device, and overall it was a rather small palm-sized gadget. It was silver and black, featuring a screen that displayed relevant signal information. The real-life reason for their compact size when compared to later versions was to make them seem more futuristic than mobile phones, which had caught up since the 1960s. But for a law reason? Well, there isn't one. Suffice to say, communicators of this era worked in tandem with a ship or shuttle's own communications to extend their range. By the 2230s, there was another iteration of the Starfleet communicator that was much bulkier than the version from 80 years earlier. I'm going to suggest that this is because there was a lot newer and more technology packed into the device, maybe even the addition of the Universal Translator. This would line up with the latter version that decreased in size, as seen with the 2250s model, which was still rather bulky, but by the middle of the decade, the communicator had shrunk in size again, but contained a simple universal translator. The device at this time featured two screens, the subspace frequency display and a text display. There are also reports of a variation of the communicator secreted in the Starfleet badge, but such a device did not enter standard use for another hundred or so years. Perhaps there existed some short-range emergency prototype? The communicator of 2260 was relatively unchanged from its earlier iterations. The antenna was the golden grill that folded down, as with other models, doubling as a protective cover for the controls. Its design matched the emerging Starfleet styles of black, silver and gold for their gadgets, on the front of the device, a small monitor portrayed the wavelength and operating frequency, while a simple display of lights indicated its status. Its only controls were to switch to communication bands between intercommunicator frequencies or ground to ship. It could also be used to tune in to other machines that had similar communication functions, as well as a wide range of non-Starfleet devices. This device was rather robust too, and one was issued to every away team member, and generally every member of a ship's crew during heightened alerts. The communicator doubled as a way for a ship to track its crew, as opposed to using the more difficult to discern life signs or even visual scanning. This enabled near instantaneous transporter locks to beam the individual back to the pad or perform a sight to sight. This era of communicator, however, was susceptible to dangerously low temperatures. By the early 2270s, Starfleet had continued to fashion more ergonomic designs with the miniaturisation of the communications technology. Some variations that were tried out included a wrist-mounted variant, harkening back to ye olde smartwatches. This variation did not last long, however, and by 2285, there were several more designs similar to the older models of Flip-Up Communicator. Interestingly enough, one of these was much larger than the other, and I would wonder if this was including some technological prototypes. Eventually, the device was adapted from being a separate object, which was easier to lose, into the COM badge, which was always worn and more inconspicuous. 
This saw the integration of all the technology of a communicator and more into something no bigger than the Starfleet insignia. From this point on, the designs only really changed to reflect the different eras of Starfleet's combadge emblem throughout the 2360s and onwards. The workings were encased in a Duranium Starfleet Delta coated with worthless gold and silver, but it looked nice and shiny. The power cell of a communicator was a cerium crelide battery as found in tricorders. If left in continuous operation, the battery would deplete over two weeks, but this rarely happened as communicators were often in a standby mode until activated. If the flip-style communicators of early Starfleet were simple to use, this was child's play. To activate the device, you simply had to tap the badge, triggering its sensors, and flipping it into active mode. It would then listen for the identification of the user and the desired recipient, whether that be to another away team member, an inter-ship communication, or even a ground-to-orbit one. The small computer in the com badge would then decipher the user's request, switch to the appropriate subspace band, and ping its target badge to establish two-way communication. This process was very fast, although several seconds delay was common as the little transceiver assembly and encryption circuitry did its job in establishing a link. As for how it picks up and plays voices, well, nothing overly fancy here, it's just a tiny microphone and speaker, although obviously track levels of advanced. Unlike the early communicators, however, this device featured much more automation based on its voice recognition. The com badge, for all intents and purposes, was also a functional universal translator. When being used in this commodity, it translated all received audio into a tongue the wearer could understand and vice versa for anyone the user was talking to. This function was only possible, however, within the range of a ship's main computer, or if the language had been downloaded into the device. The STA produced a rather weak field and could only transmit around 500 kilometers from badge to badge. However, within range of a starship, the vessel's own systems operated in tandem with the com badge, extending the range to 6,000 kilometers. A standard Starfleet orbital path was generally around 40,000 kilometers above the surface. Civilian iterations of the device also exist, with the technology being so useful and common throughout the Federation. Other powers also utilised a com badge design, and I like to think that Starfleet was a bit of a trendsetter in that regard, but who knows. So, that is a brief history of the communicator from its original iterations to the point where it quadrupled in size for some reason, then gradually scaled all the way back down again before becoming a tiny badge. When compared to mobile phones, it's obvious that the communicator was superior for its FTL capabilities and extended range. Wait, hang on, what's the average range of a mobile? 45 miles or so before reaching a tower. Okay, good. Star Trek doesn't have to move its goalposts yet. But with our connected world growing every day in speeds and range, it's only a matter of time. Thanks for watching this lore video, and I'll see you next time. Rick out.